to entrench across the whole company. So uh, we don't really work with things like, we don't really have a holacracy at Recruity, but we don't really think about hierarchy so much. We think more about responsibility towards metrics. So we have team leads who are responsible for metrics, and we have departments, but we think about it very holistically. So for me, whenever there is a challenge, the question is always, what is going to move your needle towards growing the business? Which means that Recruity is also part of the fact that I'm one of the C-levels at Recruity, which means I'm also very holistically involved in this, but I work with customer success, and I work with legal, and I work with finance. Because one of the things that's really, really important, I'm going to emphasize this throughout this talk, is the alignment between departments. You can't silo growth into one department who is thinking a certain way, and the rest of the departments don't really know what's going on. So I think it's really good that you have people from different departments here. Because there will come a point when you're growing really fast where you find that maybe your biggest blocker isn't going to be ads, but it might be finance, for example. If you only have one finance person, we had this, we had one finance person, we couldn't keep up with invoices. So we actually had sale, a situation where sales had to slow down what they were doing because finance couldn't handle the invoice load. Or when we're working with DPAs and different legal um, processes with our clients, we would often find legal as the biggest blocker. We're trying to organize lots of events, there could be a legal blocker. So growth is something, it's one of the reasons I don't, you'll never hear me use the word growth hacking. I haven't in years, um, because I think there's a little bit of a misconception. There's a lot of people who call themselves growth hackers these days, and I, I don't like the word hacker in it, I think it's a bit misleading. So um, I like to talk about growth quite holistically, but I'm gonna go through all of this. Just wanna say it's really important that, the, that all of the departments align. But what, what's the misleading part? Well, first of all, you're not a hacker, let's be honest. 90% of self-proclaimed growth hackers nowadays don't really code. Uh, even though they say they do, most of them don't. Um, and I think there's been this focus that you have a lot of people emerge who only focus on shortcuts. And I think it's great that you want to be efficient, and you want to be quick, and you want to find the fastest and easiest and most efficient way to a result, and you want to be data-driven. So a lot of this kind of hacker culture can be very good, but you see more and more people misunderstanding it as you know, let's scrape this list and e cold email them and maybe this will work. But there's a difference between hacking away and trying to find shortcuts towards achieving something and on the other side trying to build a multi-million if not billion dollar business. So I see a lot of people, a lot of marketers who adopt, what you have nowadays is you have a lot of old school marketers adopting the new school, but you don't have that many new school marketers adopting the old school, which is the core principles of growing a business. You know, the psychology of users and customers, the general, you know, business and entrepreneurial and economic knowledge that you need. And I think that's been a problem quite a lot. Also, when I've been hiring growth marketers, you have these people who can, I'll give you an example, they can hack away at their Facebook audience like an absolute boss, but then the copy they write in the ad is crap, and it doesn't perform. And then the ad's not performing because the copy doesn't reflect the product or the user's pain at all, and then they're still tweaking and kind of micro-optimizing things 10, st 10 steps down the funnel, even though they don't have their base foundations right. So this is one of the reasons I try to avoid the word hacker as a whole, because there has been this big movement of people who think that they're growth marketers, but they're actually not. Because what they do works when you're trying to get 10, 15 customers, but if you're trying to grow a business over one, two, three years with a growth map, OKRs, KPIs, the hacking part is not the most important part always. So I think a lot of the stuff that goes into the hacker mindset should be in your mindset anyways. But I'll go into this as we go along. So I want to start with defining growth. Does anyone here have a, like a preset definition in their mind of growth? Like, what have you guys heard? Yeah, I always, I always like to define growth marketing as data-driven data -driven marketing. Yeah. I think experimenting is really inherent also on it. Mm -hmm. but yeah, but I don't think there's a specific definition set for it yet. But I think those two are really important, data-driven and experimenting. So rapid ex experimentation, I should say. Yeah. I would define it as getting out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, getting from where you're now to somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, not, not only focusing on, on acquisition or awareness, but also like on the entire funnel. Yeah. Cool. You don't all have to, but if you want to, feel free. To <laughs> no. No. Does uh, marketing, uh, the word marketing has to go with growth? Or can growth live by itself? Well, we're going to discover that. Go <laughs> okay, let's go on, let's go on. That's a very good question. So this is the hard thing, which is growth hacking and growth marketing when it emerged was this totally new approach. It was taking the concept of you know, the lead movement and applying it to marketing. That's essentially how it emerged. Thinking full funnel, being data-driven, experimenting, so everything you guys said, thinking outside of the box, leaving your comfort zone. I think these things were very true. So when growth hacking and growth marketing started kind of like a movement, 
Um, because it started like a movement, we started assigning kind of what I would see as best practices as the definition. Because at the end of the day, you know, you'll hear some people will call it marketing, some growth hacking, some growth marketing, some growth. There's so many words out there. And I always try to think about what is the definition of this thing? Because I used to teach this at Growth Drive a lot, and you say, well, you need to be data driven, you need to experiment. But then you take someone who has all of this knowledge and taken two days or six weeks of course, you put them inside a company, and then you have the reality of there's all these different people, there's these different roles, the stuff that you read on paper won't always apply in practice, the challenges you had on paper won't always apply in practice. So this how do you make a definition that applies across the board? So I try to think about this a lot over time and really think about what are the core disciplines that constitute growth. Because now that growth marketing is more than just a hype, because when you had the rise of the hype, you had the emergence of a lot of influences, like who's, who's sort of Josh Fechter? Mm. Okay, Gilles Leclerc, these kind of people. Okay, I don't have the best reputation on talking about them because uh, I'm not always super kind to the kind of pseudo inspirational, let's face out our LinkedIn posts to get a lot of clicks kind of people. But what you see is these people are no longer active ever. And there's a reason because growth marketing started as a hype and as a movement. So when there's a hype and a movement, it's easy to get away with inspirational fluff. But now, data driven is just the new way to go. So at the time, you had to educate people, oh, it's about being data driven, but now everyone should be data driven, no matter what you do. You have data driven sales, you have data driven marketing, you have data driven customer success. So suddenly, if you only focus hey. on the data driven, hey. uh, if you only focus on the data drivenness, it no longer defined marketing in itself or growth in itself. The same thing applies. For example, we try to avoid using words like content marketing, because when have you ever seen marketing without content? Every ad is text. You know, marketing is all content. Your product is a type of content. You know, at the end of the day, these have just become the core principles of what you should be doing. So when I tried to define what constitutes marketing and growth, this is the kind of definition that I came up with. I talked to so many different people about this, and I thought maybe we should just start thinking about data and experimentation as the norm of how you do things in general, the mindset, and instead we focus on the core disciplines that fall within growth. So I split it into three things, which is custom acquisition, you can call this user acquisition, you can call this lead generation, depending on how you want to set up. Branding, a product growth. Because ultimately these are the three things that I see myself responsible for. And you can be responsible. Some of these things you can silo a little bit more. Never suggest siloing, but some of these things you can do within your department. Some of these things you can't do without reaching across departments. You can't do proper custom acquisition if you don't have good marketing sales alignment. You can't do proper branding if the things that you want to create aren't in line with the vision of the founders. You can't do proper product growth if you're not reaching across the aisle to work with the product team and to actually increase the user's experience and grow the user within your product. So this is kind of the three disciplines that fall into this. Now this sounds simple, but then when you break these things down, you can see where does all this happen? Because when you take, when you listen to some growth marketers talk, you hear someone talk for a day or 20 minutes or 30 minutes, it has to be simplified. And that's not a criticism, you have to simplify it. Uh, when we did the growth track courses, we couldn't, you can't tailor it to every person who's in the room. You have to come down with the core principles. But then when you start doing it, you start realizing stuff enters your sphere that you never expected. I'll give you an example. We had one big challenge, which is we do a market expansion strategy. So we try to expand to different countries in Europe. And then what we realized was that there came a point where 40% of our revenue was coming from non-English speaking countries. And then that's a problem because suddenly you want to write a beautiful headline. So you spend 20 minutes tweaking, optimizing, even like days testing the perfect headline in English. And you put so much effort and love and everything into this headline. And then when you have to do it in German, you just copy paste it into a, into a translation. <laughs> And then what's happening is that the English-speaking users are having this beautifully optimized user-centric experience, whereas the German and French users, who are now constituting, in our case, 30-40% of our revenue, are having a way lesser experience. And we're thinking, how do we fix this? And I messaged, uh, I messaged one of the senior marketing people at HubSpot, um, someone at Intercom, people that I know, and said, how do you guys do this? And they said, well, we have a localization manager, obviously. Now, there's not a single growth course in the world that's going to talk to you about localization managers. Why? Because it's a very niche thing. But localization is not only about translating your content, but I, I learned this new word called transcreation. I'd never heard this before. It's not translating a word from English to German. It's trying to recreate the effect you tried to achieve in English in German. Now, we're going to go, I'm going to talk about localization a little bit in the afternoon anyways. But the idea here is that 
when you hear customer acquisition, when you hear product growth. This could mean so many different things depending on your strategy, your business model, the approach you have, uh, your target audience, all these things can change over time. So this is just a list of things that I found fall into customer acquisition. So lead generation, content and inbound, uh, SEO, SEM, PR and social, marketing sales alignment, super important. Um, in my case at Recruity, if I wanted to focus on really easy metrics, I could just move all of our budget to US. If I move all of our budget to US, our cost per click goes down, the number of leads goes up, the number of MQLs, people signing up for trials and demos, goes really high up. Then the head of sales comes to me, knocks on my door, well, I don't have a door, but still, <laughs> knocks on my table and says, oh, what the fuck, we, we get all these American leads. In the US, we have 20 competitors with up to 300 million euros of funding. We lose deals way faster in the US than we do in Germany. Because in Germany, they want you to be, have your data center based in Germany. So already, there's only two companies competing with us in the world when we're dealing with German clients. In Europe, you have the GDPR. So then the salespeople come to me and say, well, all of, all of this is great, the numbers look great, but we close 20% of American deals versus 70% of German deals. So maybe, even if you're, say, maybe if you're having your price on a certain region, if you were to shift it back, we would actually make more money in the long run because the deals close better. So that's why you can't silo this stuff off. So marketing and sales alignment is super important. Product marketing, conversion rate optimization, A-B testing, lead nurturing, market expansion, everything from the strategic to the executional, this all kind of falls into here. So that's kind of how we define customer acquisition. Now, this doesn't mean that you're going to do all of these things, by the way. You will do the things that matter most. And you need to test these things. This is where experimentation and testing comes into play, validating which of these are going to move the needle the most. Branding, same thing. I don't come from a traditional branding background. I come from a customer acquisition, move to product growth background. So for me, branding was always more of a nuisance than a, than a, than a goal. Often, you know, you want to ship a landing page, but then it's not in line with the brand, so it gets slowed down. But what I realized, and this is again something that if you are too much focused on the hacking stuff, you might neglect, branding is super important because you have competitors and you have a lot of people and you know, you think your product's like, you, you think your product's this good, everyone thinks their product is this good, but their product is actually this good. And when you're talking to a user, they think the product they're using is this good, even though it's actually this good. So you always, your product needs to be twice as good as the user thinks their current product is, for them to even bother switching over. It's really based on an intercom principle that they use. And then branding helps do that a lot. So when you have a strong brand, a strong brand presence, you can actually retain users, even if there are better solutions on the market. There's a lot of companies that do this really well. And when you have overload of content, overload of communications, having a strong brand presence really lets you set yourself apart. So it's something that we found that we had to embrace, because in the early days when you're trying to get your first 100, 200, 300 users, you don't really care about this stuff that much, but eventually you really need to start focusing on this. And then there, all kinds of stuff comes in line, from design to content to communications to PR to the events that you organize. Everything that communicates, communicates the image of your company outwards falls into branding. And then this is the part where, what David said also, that you want to go full funnel, you want to go deeper, is product. Now this is probably the biggest change in marketing in the last five to ten years, which is that marketing is no longer something where you're attracting attention to an existing product that you can't really change or adapt. It's really two-sided, which is you're trying to sell a product to people, but you're also trying to build a product that people are going to buy. And this is the big, big difference between marketing today and marketing back in the day. And this is still something that gets neglected by about 85% of companies in Europe, because it's not easy. You need to have a completely different skill set, and you need to be able to work with product people and align with them very directly, and you need to be able to align the goals, these goals and these goals and these goals quite closely. And then product growth will look different depending on who you have, as who you have on your team, what skills you have available, who your audience is and what your product is. But everything that's feature discovery, if you have many features, for example, feature discovery, feature prioritization, um, if you have a product with multiple offerings, it's offering discovery, offering adoption, um, the user experience throughout the different, for example, in your case, you know, the sign up, the checkout flow, these kind of things. So you need to really make sure that on the product side, people are getting an amazing experience because you want people to return and repurchase or release. You want people to refer others and you want people to be getting the maximum out of their product. Uh, a good friend of mine is kind of a customer, su a customer success wizard and he always says successful customers are more important than happy customers. That's really important. Understand what your customer wants to achieve and make sure they're successful with your product. Now, it might be emotional goals they have, it might be 
practical goals, might be professional goals. But that's super, super important because a successful customer who is unhappy will still use your product. But a happy customer who's unsuccessful will churn from your product. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean you shouldn't have happy customers, by the way. You should always have happy customers. But ultimately, the success of the customer is important. What they're trying to achieve with your product or your service ultimately has to be what they're getting, and they have to do that very successfully.